My name is Mark Barnico, and I'm the executive director of the University of Chicago Francis and Rose Ewan campus here in Hong Kong. Thank you for joining our sports series, Rethinking the Olympics, uh, the Dynamic Sustainable Model. We're sharing today's event live via Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube from the UChicago UN campus in Hong Kong on this wonderful day here. If audience members have questions to submit, you can do so through the question and answer button by first registering on Zoom. I also encourage you to visit the UN campus website at www.uchicago.hk and subscribe to our e-news for the latest campus programs information. Or you can also follow the UChicago Hong Kong social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Every four years, athletes from all over the world gather and compete in the Olympic Games. Cities invest millions in persuading the Olympic Committee they should win the right to host the Games. Host cities are often betting that Olympic events will foster a sense of national unity and reap huge economic benefits for the host. But have the cost of hosting the Olympics outstripped the benefits? And what's the role of mega sporting events in shaping national branding and redefining its cultural identity? And is there a way to do it more sustainably? Today, we'll discuss the importance of global sporting events and the economic impact on the host and a potential new model of dynamic sustainability for all future Olympic Games. Let's start the morning with a brief introduction of our speakers. Professor Andrew Zimblist is the Robert A. Woods Professor Emeritus of Economics at Smith College. He's consulted in the sports industry for players, associations, cities, companies, teams, and leagues. Professor Zimblist has published several dozen articles and 28 books, including the International Handbook on the Economics of Mega Sport Events, Circus Maximus, the Economic Gamble Behind Hosting the Olympics and the World Cup, No Boston Olympics, How and Why Smart Cities Are Passing on the Torch, and finally, Rio 2016, Olympic Myths, Hard Realities. Professor Maria Guayardo is the Professor of International Liberal Arts and was formerly Dean and Vice President at Soka University. She researched cultural competency, inclusive excellence, and the role of the 2020 Tokyo Olympics in shaping the narrative for Japan's culture and national identity. Professor Guayardo is the recipient of numerous honors and awards, including the 2006 National Women of Vision Award the 2008 Award for Municipal Excellence from the National City uh, League of Cities, and the 2009 Martin Luther King Jr. Humanitarian Award. She was also honored by a Congressional Commendation for Education in October 2005, and she was also inducted into the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame in 2010. And finally, Professor Alan Sanderson is the Senior Instructional Professor in Economics and the College at the University of Chicago Kenneth C. Griffin Department of Economics. He's an authority on sports economics issues with research interests in the economics of sports, economic impact analysis, education, and labor markets. Professor Sanderson has received the Quantrell Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching and has the distinction of having taught more students at the University of Chicago than any professor in the history of the university. Professor Sanderson has written and contributed to journals on a variety of topics, including the NCAA and college athletics, the case for paying athletes, the economic impact of sports on college and university communities, the economics of sports stadiums, hosting big ticket events, and the political economy of Chicago's unsuccessful bid to host the 2016 Olympics. His 2019 publications include the Econ Economics of National Collegiate Athletic Association in the Sage Handbook of Sports Economics and the Nobel Prize in Economics Turns 50 in the American Economist. Welcome again, Professor Sanderson. Let's have you start us off this morning with your thoughts on the state of the Olympics. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark, uh, for the introduction. Um, yeah, interesting time uh, since at the moment um, there is the World Cup, but not the Olympics. Uh, I'm not a huge soccer fan, so I don't much care. Uh, but uh, a lot of people are glad to have the World Cup instead of the Olympics in, in many cases. Um, 
It's also interesting because the next Olympics will be 2024 in Paris. And um, the 1994, 100 years ago, uh, Olympics were also in Paris and was the backdrop or the basis for the Academy Award winning movie Chariots of Fire. Uh, so kind of coming coming full uh, full circle in that. Um, also in that hundred years or if I think 50 years or even less, uh, certainly one of the big factors, has been the role of the media and television. Uh, now, uh, networks uh, within the United States and outside the United States uh, spend a, a lot of time and effort uh, in trying to maximize revenues uh, from being the host uh, host country or host city uh, for these. It's uh, hugely important uh, for them. Um, also, uh, there are uh, so many, if I go back 100 years and think about the beginning of college athletics or just 50 years ago or 25 years ago or 25 years in the future, how this has changed and how much money comes into the Olympics through television and color television. And um, it's tremendously important. It's also tremendously lucrative for a number of, uh, a, a, a number of organizations. Um, the, uh, also the, there is, in addition to our major Olympic events or World Cup events, certainly the explosion in the NCAA within the United States and uh, football, basketball, and, and other sports, uh, other professional leagues, uh, soccer, and so forth. Um, so uh, it's uh, just an explosion and on, on television as well. Um, and there are within the United States, in terms of if there's something that I would say is kind of cutting edge and not just an extension, uh, it would be the, the ultimately the paying of college athletics and college athletes uh, in, in this country. And uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of things are turning on the basis of money. Uh, in, within the United States, uh, more than, than than any other place at the moment, uh, and it may well bring us a different model, and maybe something we will talk about over the course of the the evening. So let me uh, leave it there and pass the torch along. Great, thank you so much for your remarks, Ellen. Um, again, I'm Maria Wajardo, and what I'd like to do, being based here in Tokyo, Japan. I'd like to be able to speak to the sustainability of the Olympics from the perspective of uh, the city of Tokyo. So I'd like to look at the, pres the past, the present, and then perhaps offer some thoughts on the future. So in terms of the past, in 1964, Tokyo was selected as the city to host the Olympics that year. It was very significant. They were coming out of World War II and there was this sense of uh, being able to be welcomed back onto the international stage. And due to that uh, emergence, it was very symbolic. So towards that end, the, 20, the 1964 Olympics um, brought innovation. The Shinkansen or the bullet train was introduced to the world. Um, the expressway, which was a rebuilding of the infrastructure within the city of Tokyo was also presented because remember, due to World War II, 80% of Tokyo had been bombed out. So there really was a need during that post decade of World War II to rebuild the, the city of Tokyo. So the 1964 Olympics provided that opportunity. There were short and long-term goals that were addressed. It was successful in that in, it was an economic emergence, not only of Tokyo, but of the country. So then we fast forward 50 years, 
and it's 2013. I have arrived in Japan, but that makes no difference. Uh, what's important is that Tokyo has won the bid for the 2020 Olympics. Now, what I would suggest to you is that although the Olympics take part or take happen within the, the course of about 30 days, the planning begins years before. And in this case, it was palpable five years before the Olympics. So Tokyo wins the Olympics, the intense planning begins. And this time, Tokyo, Japan is not emerging from a war, but very central to their positioning. And I'm really focused on nation branding here. How will the Olympics serve to present a country? So in this particular case, it's 2013, it is two years post the earthquake, the tsunami, and the nuclear disaster in Fukushima. And Tokyo presents its bid as an opportunity to once again uh, stand on that international stage, evoking the sense of innovation. We have come out of these triple disasters, we are innovative, and we are taking the country forward. So in that sense, this capacity to innovate solutions was the branding tagline for much of what happened leading up to the 2020 Olympics. Now that was at the macro level, but let me tell you about the micro level. So here I am in Tokyo and all of a sudden there is much buzz everywhere about the bid. And what do we begin to see? So on a personal level, it does have impact here within the metropolis one of those small changes, but very significant changes brought about by winning this bid and preparing for the 2020 Olympics is something as small as English signage in train stations. That might seem almost irrelevant, but I would suggest to you that this begins to position how Japan views itself, needing to connect to an international community that hopefully will be present here attending the Olympics and in the stadiums and viewing the sports events. So at a micro level, changes begin very rapidly. It's everything from that English signage to doing things like the convenience stores are, I don't know if they're required, mandated, strongly suggested, but they move their pornographic material from the central space in by the front door to the back corner. Again, that begins to suggest that the identity, the image of Japan is being shifted by the Olympics. These are minor changes, but I would suggest to you that they are major cultural shifts in how we begin to think about the Olympics. Another big move, again, what happens when the Olympics comes to your town? Well, at a university, it changes our schedule. The Ministry of Education suggested, strongly suggested that every university change its calendar. We began a week early, we ended a week late, a, a week early. The other thing is that holidays are moved. Imagine in the United States that someone says to you, Labor Day will no longer be on the first Monday of September. We're now going to move it to the first day, the opening day of the Olympics. That's exactly what happened in Japan. A holiday was moved. Why? Because they wanted to keep people at home in order to provide greater access to transportation. So these are micro examples of how a country begins to shift when the Olympics is coming to town. It's very directly related to the image that a country wants to present to the world. Now, as we all know, we keep going forward 2020, the Olympics, the pandemic happens, and now the Olympics are in question. Should they reschedule? Should they cancel? What's going to happen? Well, definitely because of the state of emergencies, one of five that were imposed here in Tokyo, there is growing public opposition to the Olympics. So there's begin, there begins to be a balancing between what are the economic losses of not sponsoring and hosting the Olympics? How do you balance that against the loss of life? Very real, very serious endpoints here. So how do we begin to think about this? So all of a sudden, this goal of innovation that was the brand part of the Olympics, of presenting Tokyo, Japan to the world once again on an international stage, recovering from a triple tragedy, all of a sudden now it's how do we hold on given the pandemic? 
Not only that, but also what's beginning to emerge are the bribes and the chaos that comes out of the fraud. Black Tidings was one of those major um, occurrences that happened. So one of the questions is what will an Olympics reveal? What it gets revealed in order for it to be branded as either successful or not successful, some of that I would suggest to you depends on the revelations that are made during the planning and the lead up to the Olympics. So in 2021, the Olympics were hosted in Tokyo, but not all in Tokyo. Because of the weather, some of the, like the marathon had to go up to the most Northern Island in Hokkaido, right? So all of a sudden there were very practical changes and the country was still closed. So there were no audience members to speak of uh, from outside of Japan. Imagine our country here in Japan only opened up to the world last month, last month. So does there, is there economic impact? Absolutely. But the question is, was it caused by the rescheduling of the Olympics or was it caused by the pandemic which led to the rescheduling? So there's lots of unanswered questions. So I'm just going to leave it with some thoughts about well, moving forward, what will it mean? I would suggest to you that we have to begin to change the cultural narrative of the Olympics. We have to be able to, on the one hand, look at, is this identity that's presented to the world based on what we call people diplomacy, being able to present your best image, or is it really beginning to change, as we saw in the 2020 Olympics, athlete to people diplomacy, where athletes are beginning to take a stand? I think in terms of the narrative, we also have to move away from this romanticized vision that the Olympics are not political. I would suggest to you, they are political from the beginning to the end, not only in the planning, in the recruitment of being able to get the vote, but to what actually happens in the Olympic village with the athletes. And then in terms of changing the narrative, I would hope that moving forward, we could be more collaborative in a transparent way that we be able to judiciously examine the cost to the planet and to the people in terms of sustainability, and that we begin to question the standard bearer here around ethics. 2022, the media has been full of co corruption and arrest charges um, of Olympic committee members in Japan. That is the legacy right now today in November of 2022. So lots more questions and answers. And with that, I will turn it over to Andy. Thank you, Maria. Um, some very interesting comments on, on Japan. I hope we get a chance to discuss them later. But I'd like to, to turn to some of the questions that were sent to us, because I think uh, they're good questions. And, and the first one is, what is the bidding process for the Olympic Games? The, the historical model that the IOC has followed is that they conduct an auction every four years. Uh, to who is who? Who in the world wants to host the games? And they put the cities that that bid in competition with each other. Uh, and one of, one of the things that does, of course, is raise the bidding costs. They had risen to sixty to one hundred and twenty million dollars uh, per city. Even the losing cities are spending that amount of money. Uh, but another thing it does is it it makes cities uh, elaborate the plans so that stadiums are more and more expensive. Uh, and, and that the conveniences and the transportation networks that, that support the stadiums are more and more elaborate. And so you get the phenomenon of, if you go back to the Tokyo Games in, in 1964, other games in the 1960s and 70s, they cost under a billion dollars. Uh, to the cost in, in Beijing in 2008, which was uh, reportedly over $40 billion, or, or Sochi in 2014, reportedly between 50 and $65 billion. And I think the, the cost total, if, it was, if it's done properly for the Tokyo Games in 2021, was somewhere north of $35 billion. So the games are enormously expensive. And, and the bidding process, which was the, the IOC saying, okay, we're going to have an auction Prove to me that you're a better city than anybody else is one of the things that's behind that. Now, part of the problem is that the cost got higher and higher and cities were losing more and more and cities became less and less interested in bidding to host the games. Uh, so that if you go back to the year 2000, you may have had seven, eight, nine cities bidding to host the summer games. But if you look at the last two summer games, you had one or two cities bidding to host the games. And the IOC was embarrassed by city after city saying, no, we're not interested, either through plebiscites or city council votes or what have you. 
And so the IOC changed its model in 2019. They changed it a few times before that, they tweaked it, but the more fundamental change was in 2019, where they declared that there were, wasn't gonna be open bidding anymore. Now everything was gonna be behind closed doors. So the IOC, by doing that, basically is saying that we can't be embarrassed anymore because we're not gonna tell you which cities wanna do it and which cities are dropping out. They're just gonna announce uh, when, when a city has been, has been selected. Now this doesn't preclude the IOC telling one city behind closed doors, one city that another city is bidding X and another city is bidding X plus two and try to uh, jack up, the, jack up the, the bids in that way. So I'm not sure that the fundamental outcome is changing as a result of the bidding process. But the bidding process does create a situation where the host cities, with a few exceptions, and Tokyo in 64 may have been one of them, uh, Barcelona in 1992 was another, and Los Angeles in 1984. So you have three or four uh, over the course of the last uh, 50 or 60 years cities that made out okay, but all the other cities lose money, and sometimes they lose billions and billions of dollars. And part of the problem is that in order to host the summer games, these days you have to have basically 40 venues. It could be a little higher, a little lower, but basically 40 different sports venues. Each of those venues has parking lots and it has telecommunications equipment and it has road access and, and so on and so forth. So it's a big deal to have these venues. It also has an Olympic village, village which has to uh, sustain uh, the lives of, of 16 or 17,000 people during the 17 days of the Olympics. The Olympic villages are not just places to sleep, they're places to eat, places to, to train, places to entertain yourself with other, with other Olympians. So it's actually a village. It's not just a building or a bunch of buildings. Uh, and there's also a media village that has to be built. So there are all of these things that, that have to be built. Uh, and you have to ask yourself the question, particularly for the sports venues, why does the city have to build them? Why didn't the venues exist before? In some cases they do exist before and you have to renovate them. But the venues that didn't exist before, why didn't they exist before? They're being built for the Olympics. How come they didn't happen in the city before? The reason is because there was no economically viable use for those, uh, for those stadiums beforehand. If there was no economically viable use before the Olympics, it's really, really unlikely that 17 days later, all of a sudden they'd have an economically viable use. So you build these stadiums and most of them don't have a useful uh, life, an economic life. Uh, it might, maybe it's the case that you can use the Olympic Stadium and have an evangelist come, and maybe it's the case you can have a few a few concerts there during the year, or maybe a few sporting events. But there are 365 days in the year, and if you're going to use the Olympic Stadium 10 or 15 or 20 days, that doesn't constitute an economic use, a sensible use. And so you have this stadium becomes kind of a white elephant. It's it's not used on a regular basis and in a productive and remunerative basis, uh, and and therefore you've got to maintain it. Nonetheless, you've got to uh, spend money on maintenance, you have to spend money on operations, or you have to uh, just leave it there and let it go to, go to seed, in which case you're using 10, 20, 30, 40 acres of valuable real estate uh, that is uh, foreclosing other uses of the land. So this, this is a real issue uh, that, that comes out of the whole bidding process. And one of the reasons I, I wanted to, uh, to address that question, uh, the one of the questions is also about the, uh, the, 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 the successful games in the past. And Maria talked a little bit about Tokyo in 64. Los Angeles in 1984 is another sui generis case where the city actually had a surplus of about $220 million. There are very special circumstances there. One of the circumstances was that the previous three summer games in Mexico City, in Munich, and in, in Montreal – had all been one kind of a disaster or another, and nobody wanted to bid for the 84 games. Los Angeles was the only one standing when the final bids were, were supposed to come in. And Los Angeles said to the IOC, we'll do this, but we're not gonna guarantee the cost structure. The IOC has required every other Olympic host to guarantee that they're gonna cover cost overruns. And cost overruns are ubiquitous. They've happened every single time. The average cost overrun for the Summer Olympics is, is about 250% since 1980. So these are massive overruns and the IOC makes each city that they award the games to, to guarantee that they'll carry out all of the elements in their plan and they'll cover all cost overruns. But Los Angeles went to the IOC and said, we're not gonna do it. And the IOC had no choice because they had no bargaining leverage. There was no other city to choose. Uh, and that, they did that, and Peter Uberoth developed a new sponsorship model, marketing model that was very successful. That, together with the fact that Los Angeles, the second largest city in the United States, 
and the city that had many professional teams and many college teams playing big time sports, they had all the venues they needed, basically. So that was a sui generis. That was a unique case. Situation in Barcelona in 92 is different. I don't think I have time to talk about it, uh, so I won't go on. But the, the, the point being that there's nothing ineluctable that says that the Olympics has to lose money. It just usually uses, loses money because of the, the way in which it's produced. Uh, and it, you, you have to be, if you're a city that's thinking about hosting and you're thinking about hosting it in a way that's not environmentally and economically wasteful, you have to do a lot of planning. You have to do the planning before the IOC comes to you and tells you what they want you to do. Because if you have to twist yourself and contort yourself in order to accommodate the IOC, it's not going to work out. I think I'll pass the torch to the question and answer period, Mark. Great, Andy. Thank you so much. Uh, great comments from everybody. Um, I want to go back to something that we talked about uh, in the dry run and then leading up to this program. A um, little bit controversial, I suppose, but let's start with uh, Alan, and then everybody can weigh in on this topic. Um, are the Olympics you know, going to uh, run their course in the next uh, 20 years, um, like the World's Fair? Um, Alan, I know you. You, we, we, we talked about that, and I was wondering if you think and uh, looking into your crystal ball, that the Olympics are, you know, a dying breed? That's a good question, Mark. And, and I, I don't know. I'm just saying there are a lot of, you know, things change uh, over time. Uh, the biggest thing that changed, uh, if I look over the last 100 years or last 50 years, is television. Uh, that just affects the sporting world in general. Say how much money in the National Football League is for example, in the United States is coming out of television, huh, most of it. <laughs> for example, uh, the television has just changed things so dramatically that uh, it may well have to be a different model here. And maybe it's a model that says we don't host all of these athletic events or sporting events in one city, but in fact, have them be in different cities or in different continents. Uh, so that they're not the Olympics uh, in Tokyo or the Olympics in Los Angeles, but it's the Olympics, you know, in 2000, you know, 20, whatever, but spread out. Uh, I think that's another, uh, an, another model. Also, there's just been sort of extension of what I said before, just so much expansion in the sporting world in the last 50 years. Uh, if I look at the net from the National Football League to Major League Baseball, to, uh, some of these are old leagues, but some of them are new sports. Um, but they're, they, they capture individual nations' uh, interests more, more than others. Um, I, I, I admit I'm not a huge soccer fan, but uh, will Americans ever watch soccer? You know? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it just doesn't seem to be in our in our DNA, uh, for example. And, and other countries eat, sleep, and drink uh, soccer. Um, so, uh, and, and again, a huge, huge decreases in transportation costs and communications costs, uh, which changes a lot the logistics of, of what you do. Thanks, Alan. Um, Maria, you were up close and personal with the uh, Tokyo Olympics. Just kind of piggybacking off of that concept of uh, are the Olympics dead and the comment that Alan just made about television being, you know, ubiquitous and really it's about eyeballs. Can can the Olympics, you know, uh, will the Olympics uh, uh, fade into the into the uh, past of our consciousness, given the fact that so many eyeballs are on it from around the world? You know, I would say that it's the Olympics will fade if they do not connect to the 21st century. And television definitely caused and was impetus for some of that change today. It's social media. Um, students, my students don't watch television. My students are on their phone, right? They're carrying a computer in their pocket and they have access to the world. And I think we have to be able to run to catch up with them. And in, what I mean by that is that we have to be able to heighten our own level of, of comfort with the complexity of changing times. 
And that complexity, I love this idea, Alan, of having multiple cities with diverse uh, sports at, at different venues. I mean, I love that idea. So I think it's really reimagining possibilities. So will it die? It, it will die if it does not change. And I think that is true for anything on our planet. And I really think it's a matter of will. It's a matter of being able to take what is this tip of the iceberg, which has this, you, you know, the Olympics are this perhaps idyllic, romanticized version of what, of possibility, of possibility. That dream of hope should not die. And the challenge for all of us is to really begin to examine what will we allow in order to reimagine possibility. Thanks, Maria. Um, Andy, can you elaborate? And what are your thoughts on the whole dying breed of the Olympics concept and television and social media and eyeballs and all these concepts that the other speakers have brought up? Uh, so the world is definitely changing and there are lots of challenges to change along with it. Uh, but I do think that the Olympics is still immensely popular worldwide. There are two, three, four billion people who, who watch the Olympic Games on at least the summer games. It's slower for the winter games, but the summer games on television. Um, and the Olympics um, likes to say and likes to believe that it has an impact on, on world culture by bringing athletes from over 200 nations together and plunking them all down the Olympic village and having them live together and have fun together for, for a period of 17 days. And they think that that symbolism of bringing the world together to compete on the playing field rather than on the battlefield, that that's a powerful and important symbol. I'm just an economist and I can't really assess that argument. I like to believe that it were true, that that could happen. I don't know if it does or not, but part of the problem, I, I like Alan's idea, but I do think part of the problem is that if if we're holding on to this idealism about, about the symbol of, of the Olympic games uh, and we're holding on to the extra excitement that comes from the sport mega event, um, then we, we pretty much have to do it. We have to bring everybody together, I think. We can't have... Um, the rowing happening in Tahiti and the, um, the road races happening in New York City and so on and so forth uh, down the line. Um, so I think that, that a, a, another possible way to think about the Olympics going forward is rather than having a new city built the entire Olympic Shangri-La with its 40 sports venues and so on and so forth and spending billions of dollars, rather than having a new city do that every four years, is have a permanent place for it, have a permanent place for the summer games and a permanent place for the winter games. Um, I think there's an obvious place to do the summer games, which is Los Angeles. I don't think I'm being jingoistic in saying that or nationalistic in saying that. Uh, I don't know if the people of Los Angeles would want to have the commotion there every four years, but they have all the venues and they have a modern uh, communications and hospitality and transportation infrastructure. Um, and, and so they can do it as they're doing it for 2028. They're going to do it with minimal cost and minimal environmental disruption and, and virtually no evictions of people. Part of the problem is that to, to run the Olympic and the summer games, you need over a thousand acres of, of land, at least a thousand acres of land. And in order to get that in, in a complicated and, and um, very condensed urban environment, you have to push people away. Uh, and so in Rio in 2016, they pushed 77,000 people out of their homes in favelas. Uh, and in Beijing in 2008, they uh, reportedly uh, evicted over a million people from their homes. And it goes on and on. So I, I, I think that rather than uh, thinking the solution is to have different sporting events in different cities um, during the same time of year, have one city do it all the time. And, and if, if Los Angeles doesn't want to do it or people think that it's uh, uh, too beneficial to the United States, then let's build the Olympic Shangri-La somewhere between Athens and, and Olympia in Greece, where there's, there's plenty of land and people, people have looked at that. Um, and let, let, let's not continue to waste our resources and, and despoil our environment by building, building buildings and facilities that aren't going to have any uh, economically viable use going forward. Great, Andy. Thank you so much. Um, um, I, each of you have kind of uniquely been involved in the Olympics, um, the bidding process or reflections on the Olympics for different cities, Alan, Chicago, Maria, Tokyo, and then Andy, uh, you with Boston and Rio, uh, maybe starting with Alan, you know, can you talk about like Chicago's motivations 
for wanting to even bid on the Olympics back when they did? And what what were the sort of reasons for losing out or throwing in the towel? And then the other layer of that conversation I would like to ask you about, has any have any of the cities really been looking at the environmental impact um, going back, you know, the last 20 years on, on their cities? Yeah, the, the, um, the, the last thing you mentioned, the environmental impact, I think across the board, uh, the, the, no matter what we're talking about, relocating a new factory or starting a new industry or whatever, uh, environmental impact, whether it's just kind of, you know, serious or not serious, but that, that becomes a variable, a factor in, in, in so many of our decisions these days. Uh, and not that it shouldn't, but it, it, it's, it's there. And, and certainly hasn't been, say, wasn't 50 years ago or something. Um, I'm, uh, I, I guess uh, it's now been so many years since uh, Chicago was thinking about bidding for 2016. I've almost blocked it out of my mind in terms of what, what were we thinking uh, <laughs> in that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I really don't have a, ho a whole lot to add other than I, I don't think it was a serious, really a serious bid. Oh, so, I mean, that's kind of an interesting concept. And maybe, Maria, you can pick up on that. I mean, do, do cities bid just to raise visibility, like international visibility with not really no serious uh, or compelling reason? Um, other than to have that visibility, Me, Maria, maybe you can answer the previous question and then and then follow on with this last uh, last part of the question. Well, I think both of those questions are connected to this concept of cultural diplomacy. I don't think it's just to present your country sort of that's the tip of the iceberg. It's really looking but beneath the waterline and asking what. The leadership of your country. So for us, it was Prime Minister Abe, um, who was, as you know, recently assassinated. But when he put that bid out and he publicly championed the bid for the 2020 Olympics, um, it was not, it, it was, I mean, in the country, it was palpable. You could feel the importance of this for positioning the country politically, economically. It was, well, the Olympics weren't going to bring in immediate economic benefit. There was that strategy that long term, the promotion of tourism, the promotion of the uh, sort of presence of, of the cultural presence of the country, that, that all of that would carry weight into the future. This sense of soft power of being able to then position yourself politically on that global stage, I think is very important. So I still remember the press conferences leading up in 2020 when that decision had to be made, will we cancel or reschedule? And I remember the mayor of Tokyo in her green suit, very publicly saying, basically over my dead body, will we cancel and not hold this, right? I mean, it was, it was tension filled. It, every player was voicing, public polls were against it. Uh, and the numbers were rising. So there was nothing small about this decision, but it was really the decision we've gone too far to turn back. So that motivation was, I, I think sometimes that momentum keeps you going. It felt to me from the ground that it would have been impossible to say we're canceling the Olympics. So much was invested in, in that presentation of the country to the world. You know, it seems as you talk, Maria, that, um, you know, the Tokyo Olympics were more about a cultural opening. And I was in Tokyo a year before the Olympics were uh, officially um, uh, meant to begin. And I was just amazed at how uh, little uh, you know, people that were really there to help try to facilitate tourism coming in, how, how at the airport, how, how uh, uh, poor the English language capability was. Um, and so maybe, you know, in what you're saying, this opening up culturally was kind of to be less inward looking and to be more outward looking. And I'll, I'll turn this over to Andy and then maybe Maria can follow up with uh, some comments like how many cities are really looking at it as a cultural opening to the world? 
versus um, what one of our uh, attendees is asking here in terms of a question about sort of political, you know, um, whitewashing, I think is what I've heard the term uh, to be. So like different motivations for why cities, nations want to host the Olympics. Andy? Yeah, so lots and lots of thoughts here. Um, Boston was a crazy place to try to host the Olympic Games because it's a very compact city, a geographically small city. Uh, with lots of congestion, and they simply didn't have the land available to them um, and ha had to, as they were developing their plans, they had to offer massive incentives to the private sector to, to build certain things um, and give them land for free and let them convert it to other uses afterwards. And in fact, even with all of the incentives that they're offering, they, they never really had somebody, never had a company to come forward and say, we want to build the Olympic Village, we want to build a national stadium. Uh, and so on. Um, in terms of the motivation, I, I think there's a lot of hot air here about uh, about the soft power and about opening opening up culturally. I, I think it, it, if if you look at Boston as an example, but I, I I'll talk in detail if you want about some other cases as well. The guy who was pushing the Boston bid was John Fish. He was the head of the largest construction company in New England and a big figure in Boston politics. And he got some other construction executives excited also. And then they went to some architectural firms and to some law firms and some banks, all of whom would be involved in floating loans and writing the contracts and so on and so forth. And they went, uh, they, they, they went to Deval Patrick, the governor of, of Massachusetts, and convinced Deval Patrick that this should be done. And, and he went through all sorts of machina machinations and, and devious tricks left and right in order to make it possible for Boston to conduct the bid. Uh, at the end of the day, the people of Boston realized that this was a mess financially, it was a mess environmentally. Uh, one of the things they were gonna do was knock down trees in the Boston Commons and put the beach volleyball court there. Um, people didn't like this plan, it was a crazy plan. It was being done not in the interest of raising Boston soft power or, or the United States soft power or putting the United States or Boston on the world map, it was done in the intra economic interests of primarily the construction sector. And I think you have to look at that. You have to look at the real politics. You have to look at the dollar signs um, uh, to, to understand what's what's driving a lot of these bids. I think you know, Maria, oh, go ahead, Maria, please. I, say, I think that's absolutely true. And I also know that separate from the economic gains and losses, there are there have been instances for countries, and we look at Beijing, where countries were hoping to not have certain aspects of their um, country's uh, operations revealed, whether it was human rights infringements um, or the that that sense of greenwashing in terms of yeah, we're going to be environmentally, um, we're going to minimize the impact. And then they hide what actually happens. So I think that <clears throat> the United States starts in a different place and perhaps doesn't need that sense of cultural diplomacy. I would suggest that other countries do and other countries are hoping. And I think the 1964 Tokyo Olympics was a perfect example of that, that coming out of World War II, having been occupied for seven years by the United States, having 80% of Tokyo bombed out, there was a need to step forward once again. And this country was absolutely um, in the throes of moving forward. It was almost like a, a national mandate, something yeah, that I've never I, seen. I think you're United. overstating the case, Maria. They, 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 were, they were growing rapidly in the 50s. The miracle had already started. Uh, a lot of the stuff that was built was going to be built anyway, which is one of the reasons why the Olympic Games were successful. The, the soft power argument doesn't work for another important reason. And it doesn't matter if it's the United States or some other city or some other country. It doesn't work because there is no long-term economic benefit in terms of trade, in terms of foreign investment, in terms of tourism. It just isn't. People have done econometric studies and looked at those variables over and over again. There's virtual unanimity that this is not something that promotes the economy in the long run. Politicians can say that it will because they have to justify their support of, of the project. But just because politicians say it doesn't make it true. Maria, you want to respond to that? I would just say that cultural diplomacy is not 
singly defined by economic benefit? Of course not. Of course not. But you have, look, it's a two way street. You get put on the television sets of a billion television sets around the world. Uh, and, and that could be either good news or bad news for your country. You could either burnish your image or you could tarnish your image. Uh, certainly Mexico in 1968 tarnished its image. Certainly Munich in 1972 tarnished. Certainly Montreal in 1976 tarnished their image. And you can go on and on. Certainly it's happening to Qatar today. Uh, it happened in, 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 in Sochi in, in 2014. It happened in Rio in 2016. Um, and so you can say that I'm doing this to increase my soft power. I'm doing it to make ourselves look prettier to the rest of the world. But it doesn't always happen that way. And I, I, I'd be sorely pressed. You can point to an example in a particular year um, where, where it may have helped. It may have helped the image of a country. But I think more often than not, it either doesn't do anything or it hurts the image of the country. Can we talk a little bit about um, which have been the most successful? And I know Maria has brought up this concept of how do we measure success? And maybe, Alan, um, you know, as um, economists, you and Andy uh, could speak to the, uh, you know, the economic success. But then there are other layers of, of success that we can measure by. What would have been the most successful Olympics in history? Alan, well, you know, if, if, if I... Uh, if you wanted to say economic success, as, as Andy said earlier, um, Los Angeles in 84, but that's not particularly Los Angeles in 84. It's the particular circumstances. Nobody wanted to host the Olympics. Uh, and so, um, you know, they sort of begged Los Angeles to do it. And, and uh, they threw a fairly small party. It wasn't anything to do with Los Angeles, just timing of, uh, of, of the thing, so I, I think uh, some of it is some of it is that, or you know, Tokyo, dumb luck, COVID, uh, in, in terms of nothing to do with uh, Tokyo. It just has to do with it. it's the wrong place, wrong time. And, and Andy, what's your assessment of? Well, the, I, would, the I, would, assessment? I would. I would. First of all, I, I think that some of the Los Angeles success did have to do with Los Angeles. It had to do with the fact that they had all the stadiums they needed. Before, right, just for the size of the city. But I, and there's another example, and this dovetails, I think, pretty well with the 64 situation in Tokyo, and that's Barcelona in 92. What happened there, as I read it, is, is that after 30, 35 years of Franco, in 1975, he dies, and the country opens up politically, and they start having democratic discussions about what they want to do to undo what, what Franco had, had done. And uh, they had very lively discussions in, in Barcelona. And coming out of those discussions, they developed a plan for redeveloping their city. Uh, and that plan emerged in around 1981, 1982. And they had, they were, the major part of the plan was that they were going to take this warehousing and manufacturing district that had been put in, right on the sea in Barcelona, at separating the city from, from the sea, they're going to take that and move it to another part of the city, and they're going to change the road structure around that. So they're going to open up the city to the sea. And that was a plan that existed in 81, 82. And a part of that plan also was a cultural expansion plan. Uh, and so they, somebody came along and said, why don't we bid to host the Olympics? We're going to build all or re-renovate all these buildings anyway, and we can use the, the Olympics as, as a financing mechanism to make the changes that we want to make anyway. Barcelona had in place a plan, they had an idea, they had a vision for their city, and they used the Olympics to, to create or further that vision. That doesn't happen typically. I don't think it's ever happened again or before, possibly excepting 64 in Tokyo, um, where the, the city basically takes the Olympics and plugs it into a plan that they already have. Mm -hmm. Invariably what happens is the IOC comes along and says, here's what we need, and find a way to do that and convince us that you're going to do it to make it convenient for us and that it's going to work out on international television. So when you have to contort yourself to meet the IOC's needs, it doesn't work out. If you have your own needs and they're well-defined and it's a good plan, which is what Barcelona had, it has some other things going for it too, but basically that's what was going on. And I would, I would classify Barcelona as successful games. And if you look at the economic data that follows that, if you look at the tourism data that follows 1992, it, it, it affirms that view. Hmm. Fascinating. Let, let me add one other thing on this too, in terms of timing, um, is 
it, it, whether we, we think about it as uh, um, the Tokyo Olympics uh, or we think about it as the 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 um, the, the uh, <laughs> sorry losing my own mind on this the 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 notion of the Nazi Olympics if I wish in 1936 uh, what do we do uh, when we come up to Berlin in 1984 uh, the Berlin Olympics are going to have to Get mentioned, and it's hard to sort of build around them. Uh, but you're, it, it, it's going to be tricky. Uh, and whether we have the Olympics in Berlin, uh, if we have the Olympics somewhere else on purpose other than Berlin, but uh, you're talking about in 2036. Pardon? You're talking about the centenary in 2036. Yes, that's Avenue. right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that is just going to be, you know, a challenge. Well, I'm, I'm interested in this comment that uh, Alan mentioned about nobody bidding on the uh, 1984 Olympics and, and that Los Angeles kind of stepped in. I vaguely remember that history, but what was the rationale? What was the what was going on that uh, that no other cities really wanted to bid at that time? Was it the economy was bad? Uh, were there other factors? Does does anybody have a sense? And and the reason I'm asking that question is, wouldn't that have been a great time to rethink the Olympics? Uh, it would have been, yes. It would. <laughs> so what happened was immediately before, uh, well, in 1980, Moscow would host hosted the games, but before before that, in 1976, the games were held in in Montreal. The mayor of Montreal uh, came out with a famous comment. He said, the, "The Olympics can no more have a deficit than a man can have a baby." Well, it turned out that the Montreal Olympics had a nine-fold cost overrun. They had an initial bid price, and the final price was nine times that. That scared bidders away. Prior to that, there was the, the disaster, the Paris disaster in Munich at, at, the, Israeli, at the Israeli dormitories. Uh, and prior to that, it was, there, was, there was the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City, where there was air pollution and thin air, and there had been a massive repression of a student movement just days before the Olympics, killing dozens of students. So each of those Olympic games had had terrible reputations. In the midst of all that, uh, Denver had received from the IOC uh, the right to host the Winter Games in 1976. They used to have the Winter Games and the Summer Games at the same time. Um, and the people of Denver revolted, and they forced the plebiscite, and they voted something like 60% to 40% uh, against having the Olympics there. They were concerned about economic and environmental losses. Uh, and so the IOC had to scramble and they put the, Olymp the Winter Olympics in 76, they sent it back to Innsbruck, Innsbruck Austria, which had hosted the games in the 1960s. Uh, so there was a lot of bad news out about the Olympics and, 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 and there was a lot of politicking that was going on around the, the Moscow games. Uh, and, and so cities were not real anxious to bid. You know, we have a few minutes left in the program. Maria, I want you to step in. You talked about re-envisioning the Olympics. I'd like to get into this concept of, you know, can should, and should the Olympic Committee be rethinking? Um, and I know each of you have your own um, particular point of view on that. But Maria, maybe you can start us off with what would a what would a re-envisioned Olympics actually look like? What should we be, you know, brainstorming about to rethink it? I think if I if I couch this in terms of what is that measure of success, how do we define success at multiple levels, at complex levels? How do we define success over the years, over the decades? That definition has evolved. I don't think that the Olympics have been static. The purpose, the 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 motivation, the thrust behind them has evolved um, decade by decade. There has definitely been this shape shifting, as we've heard described. The city wins the bid, the IOC comes in, the city shape shifts to try to meet what it is that the IOC wants and, and things move forward. As I look to the future, I would suggest that it is an opportunity to be able to not shape shift, but to absolutely reimagine possibilities. I would like to hold up the, the role of Olympians as ambassadors. Uh, in a more significant way. So really beginning, I mean, that's just one idea, but really beginning to ask, what are the new possibilities? And yeah, the economics of it, 
is one side, the political is another side, the, the human resources that, that go into this. I mean, we haven't really addressed that. We've talked about the impact on the, on the physical space, but the human resources, what does that mean? And how does that emerge both from within the Olympic uh, side, the Olympians and outside in terms of the host city? So I don't have answers, but I think probably what's most needed right now are these piercing questions about what might be possible moving forward. Alan, do you think this concept of uh, maybe having permanent locations uh, for Olympics could work? And potentially you could have, you know, one permanent location in Asia, one permanent location in the Western world, something like that. And it, you know, rotates every, every few years, Alan? You know, I, I, I suppose I would even say more, you know, pick, I'm just picking this number out of a hat, but, you know, 10, 10 locations or something like that, not, not two or three or four, but, you know, a, a larger, larger scale and soccer is played in one and, uh, you know, just each each individual sport or something. Uh, they could also be smaller venues at that point. Mm -hmm. um, it wouldn't have to be a, a giant 100,000 seat stadium or something. Uh, and, and again, I, I, I don't wish the Olympics ill, uh, but it just may be one of those things that given technology, given transportation costs, given terrorism, uh, that somehow you just have to say we can't go there anymore. Well, that's a good that's a good segue to one of the questions from the audience members about, uh, uh, and I'll direct this at Andy: canceling the Olympics as a signal to the world about climate change uh, as a statement. Well, I I think that we should uh, grab the bull by the horns rather than running away from it. Actually. Uh, Look, if 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 it's not going to be the Olympics, it's going to be the World Cup. If it's not going to be the World Cup, it's going to be the Commonwealth Games. If it's not going to be that, it's going to be F1 races around the world. Um, I, I think we, we rather than saying we're going to abolish these competitions that people seem to love, um, we should think about how we can restructure them, reorganize them so we don't destroy the environment, so we don't waste resources. The, the evidence of environmental destruction that's that's left behind by the Olympics is is absolutely striking, uh, and and we, we don't have time, but I could go over it, um, case after case where nature reserves are have been uh, torn down, uh, golf courses built on them, ski trees knocked down, and, and ski slopes being built over them. Um, it goes on and on, and. I, I think we, we need to think productively and constructively and creatively about reorganizing these events rather than saying we're going to cancel them. Uh, whether whether the, your, your listeners think that the, the Olympics is, is the best and most exciting entertainment event or not, or whether they think that the Chicago Symphony playing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony is, is more important culturally than the Olympics, the fact of the matter is that people love sports and people love the Olympics. Uh, and so I, I don't think simply striking it out uh, and pretending it, it won't exist anymore is is the productive way to do, go about this. What what can we do? What can we do? Um, or what can the Olympic Committee do to reinforce this concept of, you know, the need to be responsible environmental citizens? Um, is there a I, I would, as I, I think there should be one, <laughs> there should be one place that hosts the games every four years, mm -hmm. uh, and in between the games being hosted, that if we're going to put build build this uh, Shangri La of Olympic facilities in Greece somewhere, uh, in between the, the Olympic games, you you use it for smaller games, you use it for training, you use it for other things, uh, but build, building a new one or building several doesn't make sense to me, and. What, the reason I pointed to Los Angeles is because Los Angeles, in addition to having the sport venues, happens to have a modern, centrally located campus with, with fantastic dormitories and all the facilities you need on the UCLA campus. And they have a media village that goes to the USC campus. Uh, and, and they have the International Broadcasting Center over at the Comcast building. Uh, and so it's all there. You, you don't have to, if, if you try to have the Olympics every four years in another place where they build the Olympic village, after the Olympics leaves, they turn it into condos and they sell it to people. You can't tell the people to leave their condos 
every four years when the Olympics comes back. But if you have something ready made like Los Angeles does with UCLA, then, then you know, that, I think that's a really appealing uh, possibility. Now, again, Los Angeles, Los Angeles citizens might not want to have that disruption. The United States might not want to pick up a security bill, which is going to be one to two should one to two billion dollars every time they host the games. Uh, so it might not be the best thing for the United States, but I think that's the way to think about the Olympics going forward if we're going to be environmentally and economically responsible. Great thoughts. Uh, Maria, I'm going to give you the last word before we wrap up this morning. I would love to see the inclusion of younger voices. And I'm speaking of my own age specifically here, not my, my co-presenters, but we need to have that younger voice, that younger generation weighing in on this question. My students that are in their 20s think differently. They imagine the world differently. They, they have solutions that my small brain barely begins to grasp. And I think until we begin to have that younger voice, that young leadership in the reimagining of possibilities, we're going to be fixing it with the same tools we've always had. And I think it's time for new tools. Thank you so much. I think that's a really great way to end the program. <laughs> Andy's given us his thumbs up. Andy Allen and Maria, thank you so much. Uh, that's a great segue to Maria to uh, let me tell you and the audience a little bit more about our upcoming program. It's actually um, on December 2nd at 4 p.m. We'll host our third event at the Trailblazer Forum on our campus here in Hong Kong. Uh, and per Maria's last suggestion, and we will direct some questions to her. We've invited Vivian Kong, a Hong Kong epifencer and two-time Olympian to share her beliefs, her passions and her vision uh, to utilize sports as a platform to have a more impactful voice on society. And maybe this is just a great opportunity for us to engage her with this conversation uh, to get some of the younger people involved in the, in the dialogue. This is an in-person event here on the U Chicago UN campus in Hong Kong. And we'll share the event live via our social media platforms. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, all of our social media sites, and the UN Campus website for more information about our upcoming programs. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Enjoy this beautiful day in Hong Kong if you're here or wherever you may be.